Hello, and welcome to the Teaching Your Toddler Show. Jacqueline Harding is on our show today. Uh, I cannot wait for you to hear about her. She's got a wonderful book about play for your child. So first, um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and about um, how you got interested in this subject. Okay, so I'm Dr. Jacqueline Harding, and I got to write this book because so many parents, practitioners, researchers were saying, Jacqueline, there's so much going on in the brain. There's so much knowledge now about child development and play. Please, would you join the dots? So I thought, okay, let's do it. Um, and it's really just been a delight, as it is to be talking to you today and sharing this information, because I think we can make a lot of difference to a lot of children's lives. Absolutely. Well, um, tell us a little bit about uh, about this, about your book and about just, you know, in general, I mean, it's it's all about the brain that loves to play. And so clearly children, you know, these days play looks so different than maybe 30 years ago or even 10 years ago, honestly, like how, how does, why is this such an important topic, I guess? I think it's in it's incredibly important because just before I came on this podcast, I thought to myself, crazy thought, I thought to myself, if I could choose a developmental stage, age of brain that I would like to adopt today, I would choose a three or four year old. And you might say, why would I want the brain of a three or four year old? And the reason is, based in science, we now know that at that age, they are at the most creative, most curious, able to problem solve, able to do those wonderful mental gymnastics in creative well-being that we lose and children lose as they get older. And that needs some serious questioning about why that's happening. Absolutely. Right. And so what, um, at what stage, I mean, why, why are their brains when they're three or four like that? What, what's sort of special about that stage? I mean, I think you said, you know, they're going to lose it. Uh, I know, um, you know, when you think about learning a language, when we learn a language as an adult, we're learning like through the words, like I, I'm already automatically translating versus learning a language when you're a child like that is you're hearing, you're hearing it. You're not thinking of words. You're not thinking even like translating it into English. You're, you're, you're just hearing it. Right. And so how does that, does that connect at all to what you're, you're talking about there? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So if we change the beginning, we change the whole story. What do I mean by that? Okay, so when we're born, we have at our disposal 128 billion neurons. That's about as many stars as there are in the Milky Way, all ready to connect, all ready to wire themselves to the world and to other humans. And so it becomes really important that we nurture young brains. And brains at that age are incredibly malleable. We talk about them being able to soak up information and that is absolutely true. So every thought and each action creates a reaction in the brain. And it's incredibly exciting when we know that the brain loves to play. Play lights up the whole neocortex and particularly that prefrontal bit, which is to do with executive functioning, thinking, decision-making. And at the age you say, why did I want the brain of a two and three-year-old and what's going on? Is she mad? <laughs> well, no, because their ability to imagine, to dream is one of the highest forms of thought. And if we can hold on to that highest form of thought as we go through the education system, and as we grow up, then we're going to be able to foster young minds who are able to solve some of the problems that you and I and generations before us have created. That's the magic of what's going on in the young brain. Oh, wow. That's incredible. So I know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the education system in the UK is different than the United States, but a lot of times we sort of talk about how we 
we lose that in the education system because we don't allow for that that creativity and sort of that that like that malleability I guess because it's so you know like it's so rote or it's so sort of in the box kind of thing like are there things that parents can do even like at, at this early stage to set their their children up for once they do go into sort of institutionalized education that would help preserve that? Yeah, you, you've hit the nail on the head. And the education system was designed over 200 years ago for an industrialized society, meaning that we wanted people to do as they're told, to be rigid, to be linear thinkers, plonk away, don't question. And unfortunately, and you might ask me why, and I have no idea why we are so <laughs> dedicated to a system that is broken and is not fit for purpose. And in my book, I say that um, play is inextricably uh, bound up with learning. And if we deviate from the masterful plan of play in a sustained manner, then we will do untold damage. And what I mean by damage is that we begin to erode the that capacity to dream and to imagine and to have that highest form of thought so yes we do need to challenge education systems and everybody needs to step up and keep saying it and i'm saying it and i will continue to say it that we need an education system that is fit for purpose that values creative well-being from a neurological point of view Mm -hmm. So I'm saying from an educational point of view, from a brain point of view, and from a biological point of view, we need an education system that respects how the brain actually develops. Mm -hmm. And it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. And you ask me, well, what can parents do? Well, they can continue to do what they do, which is allowing their child to play. And to have that human connection, I've been very honoured to do all sorts of research of my own and um, some research that I conducted with Fisher Price actually which was not about toys this was about interpersonal neurobiology and it showed big word but all it really means is how do we connect to each other and what I found is that there are three really important bits to making this this sort of play very successful in the early years one is eye gaze establishing eye gaze and the second is close proximity being in close proximity that connection and the third is shared attention so when you're doing something with your child be invested in it as well mm. as much as the child is because that toddler is going to be doing some serious investigation and investing of their time and as we align ourselves remarkable things happen in the brain mm. remarkable because parts of our brain lights up the same parts as theirs do so you may say to me so you mean to say Jacqueline that actually parents and carers and grandparents and educators are going to reap the same kind of benefit as the child yes I am oh, saying that. Mm, and it's a mm. wow, isn't it? It's a fall off your seat moment. Yes. It's something to grasp, something to value. Mm. And when we know that, our neurology goes, ah, oh, so that's good. Mm. Wow, the pressure's gone. Wow. That's so, that's profound, right? Like that parents can actually like duly benefit from playing with their child that it's not just good for the kid it's good for them as well it's good for their brain that's that's incredible I think that would be that's revolutionary thing for moms and dads to hear that they they're they're also benefiting I mean and not just the bonding like you said but also like brain function truly physiological brain function absolutely and to take it one step further <laughs> If that hasn't already blown my mind and everybody else's mind, we have what's called um, a sympathetic nervous system that does all this kind of, well, it, it absorbs some of the, the sort of the negative stuff that goes on. Then we have a parasympathetic nervous system. The power of the word para means come alongside. And it goes, oh, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to be all right. And play acts as a buffer against stress. 
Now, when I go for a run, I've got pretty dodgy knees. And the last thing that I would do is go off in my little high heels trotting down the road because I know that it would it would damage my already delicate little knees. So I put on my trainers. And so I have a buffer. And we may not be going through stress at the moment, but we need to get ourselves, and I'm talking about parents and carers here, in a state where we feel some benefit from play mm -hmm. and from relaxation, mm -hmm. and so that we don't um, really buy into stress in a way that we shouldn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that analogy with the sh with your shoes. I mean, you're exactly right. You can't you cannot go running, you know, like with your <laughs> with your high heels on. Um, and I think that also, again, is a secondary benefit that you're saying is that not only are you engaging your brain, but you're also helping with that parasympathetic um, activation of your brain, where you're getting out of that fight or flight. We're so stressed out. We're so busy. We're doing all the things. And even our kids are stressing us out. But this actually can help us slow down and and bridge the bridge that brain connection. That's that's a, another really important thing I think for for people to understand when they're when they're hanging out with their kid, you know, it's not just that it's just, it's, it's really, truly benefiting both of you. Um, what about with, um, I know that I've always heard that recess sort of helps kids process their learning. Is that, is that, what is, what's going on there? Is that like, why is the physical also important for our brain? Well, we used to think that the brain and body were separate. And the kind of, I don't know what we thought really, that the brain was busy doing its own thing and the body was doing its own thing. So the connection, the poor, it's so porous mm -hmm. that if we're able to exercise the body, that we're able to get out and run, we take in better oxygen, it helps our blood flow, um, it's a feel good factor. And certainly when, when I used to be a head teacher, I noticed that the children, You'd, you'd, you'd kind of open the door and out they would rush. And when they came back, there was this sort of calmer attitude. So we kind of all need to step up and think, now, why might that be so? When you can see it happening, mm -hmm. that they are ready to learn once they have that sort of physical um, outlet, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously talking about younger children. Mm -hmm. And... There is absolutely no reason why we should interrupt the learning business with education. Oh, that was subversive. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Yeah, because um, I was very privileged again. I mean, I've been able to do some research um, funded by some really big organisations into what happens in school if, with six and seven-year-olds, if you turn the curriculum into a creative process. So I was given that challenge in two very deprived schools in England where they were failing, whatever that might mean, mm. and um, the head teachers were willing to embrace the idea. I took in a medical doctor and a scientist and a performance artist and a visual artist, and together these two schools and myself turned the curriculum into a creative process. Hmm. Now, what happened? This is what happened. This is an 18-month study. What happened is that absenteeism um, was uh, reduced. So teachers started wanting to come to school. Children wanted to come to school. The parents were like alert and alive and connecting with the school. And of course, the children wanted to come to school. And that's what you want at a very basic level. You want children to go, hey, I want to I want to come. I want to I want to do this thing called mm -hmm. learning. And then the cherry on the top is that the exams that the children then took at seven in, in this in the educational system over here rose there were, were doing better than they had ever done. So there was a sharp wow. increase in the ability to mm. sit tests. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, I don't agree that we should be sitting seven-year-olds tests in any case, but if we're going to do it, let's make sure that we give them the very best start in life. Mm -hmm. And so the brain is wired to human connection. That's what it's looking for. And it prunes and tunes according to that. 
and playful experiences where the brain has a chance to dance metaphorically, to join the dots metaphorically, to light up, and because the brain works as a whole. Gone mm -hmm. are the days when we used to talk about different parts of the brain. It's And in my book, I talk about an orchestra and a conductor being the play because mm -hmm. it's together. Yeah, and so it's all it's all one one piece, even though there's sections that's still all one. Yeah, that's awesome. that's 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 also a very innovative way to sort of think about the brain because we always I mean, I know you mentioned the frontal cortex and all of that, but um but that is that is really interesting. I'm guessing you probably have some strong thoughts on devices, device use for children, like iPads and phones. Well, um I work on children's TV shows. Um, and I work on a lot of BBC children's TV shows because I believe that if children are going to sit in front of the television or screens, we better make them the very best they can be. So I'm invited to critique and help develop children's TV shows. And you might think, well, that goes against everything that she's saying. Well, it doesn't actually, because if we are children are growing up in a digital world. There's no way that the digital world's going to go away anytime soon. So if we if they are going to watch television at a, a later age, then those programs should be developmentally correct. So rather than sitting in judgment on television shows, I get my feet under the table and they are lovely to work with because generally speaking, <laughs> what works well commercially works best for children because they're going to be engaged and they're mm -hmm. going to reap the very best benefit. Mm -hmm. So I get myself in there rather than standing in judgment, I hope. There you go. That's much more constructive. That's fantastic. And good to have that you could have your influence, I'm sure. Um before I let you go, can you are, do you have two or three examples of some activities that parents could take with their children in terms of like true playing? Okay, right. Well, play with natural materials really activates all the senses. And there are eight senses, actually. We usually only talk about a few. But also, we so getting out and about, um, playing with mud, um, playing with leaves, trees, um, collecting, talking, seeing new sites in the forest has to be the most sensory-driven play the rich sensory driven play because mm. that's what the brain really seeks out mm, mm. It seeks out those sensory experiences mm, mm, so mm. lots of time jumping in puddles lots of time hands in mud lots of time touching bark because and talking and those three things that i said which is eye contact close proximity and shared attention mm. works like magic and none of those things cost. No, exactly. And they're grounding themselves, right? Like literally on the ground, they're grounding, which I think is really important too. Just that connection with, you know, with the earth and with nature is, is uh, awesome. That's that's fantastic. Those are great, great ideas. Um, is there anything like, you know, um, besides, I mean, I guess I think you spoke about art, doing artwork or, you know, those kinds of like, I don't know, playing with clay or crayons and all that kind of thing uh, is that is that another one that you would suggest yes anything where children are touching things mm -hmm. where rich um sensory stimulation through their eyes and sound music is beautiful mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I haven't even got time to talk about what music does mm -hmm. in the brain and when children sing and they dance to the um the stimulation of anything that they've made or other sounds they're involved in it my gosh the brain gets to do some very fun things mm -hmm. that it enjoys doing so yes music one of my favorites Excellent. Excellent. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Again, Dr. Harding, her book is called The Brain That Loves to Play, A Visual Guide to Brain Development, Play and Brain Growth. Sorry, Child Development, Play and Brain Growth. I apologize. Dr. Harding, thank you again so much for joining us. Tell us before I let you go, um, where can we find out more about you? 
Um, Dr. Jacqueline Harding.com on my website. Come and yeah, chat to me, send me emails. I love talking to parents and their experiences. Um, and the book's available on Amazon. Perfect. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure that we have links in the show notes for everyone to uh, to find you. Again, we so appreciate you joining the show today. Thank you again for, for coming on the Teaching Your Toddler podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.